Hello everybody, this is CJ Wiley with more adventures on the road. I'm uh, stuck in a traffic jam down here by uh, Fort Myers in Naples, Florida. I'm my way over to Fort Lauderdale. Today I want to talk about some more deep level pool stuff and uh, I think you'll enjoy this uh, segment and be able to utilize some of these things and maybe even bring your awareness to uh, things that are going on that you might not be able to see. There's uh, a saying that we only recognize what we're familiar with and uh, I always use an example that's unusual but I'm an unusual guy. So uh, when I was in my uh, early 20s I traveled with uh, one of the best card players in the country. He specialized in Tonk, but could play any game. And uh, he was an Indian guy from Alabama. And uh, we went up to a spot in northern Kentucky. Um, and it was kind of a backwoods place. And uh, I still to this day believe that if they would have caught him doing what he did, they would have probably uh, made us disappear in the vast uh, jungle up there in that area. <laughs> but what happened was we went into uh, the place and they gambled playing pool and they gambled playing cards. So, uh, of course, I took on the pool players and he took on the card players. And uh, I ended up winning about 1800 and he lost, which I don't know if you've been around card hustlers and uh, people that make their living doing that, but they hate to lose. So uh, we get in the car and I'm like, uh, what happened? He said, man, they, they were cheating me better than I was cheating them. <laughs> and I was like, really, what were they doing? He said, I don't know exactly for sure. He said, but the only way that I can beat them is I got to put some uh, marked cards in. And I'm like, really, how do you do that? He says, uh, you're getting ready to see. So we went down about uh, half a mile down the road, and there was a little convenience store. So he goes in that convenience store and uh, buys all the playing cards that they had. They had like, uh, I think about eight decks. And, uh, you know, got back in the car, and uh, we went back to the hotel room. Well, he proceeds to open up all of those packages of cards and uh, one by one marked all the cards in all the decks, which took him several hours. But I was curious about that. I'd never seen a marked card before. So I said, uh, here, let me see that deck. I want to see where the mark is. And he said, you can't see it. And I'm like, well, I know it's there. I mean, I got great eyes. I'm sure I could see it if I compare the cards. And uh, he goes, no, if you don't know where it's at, there's no way you can see it. So I took on the challenge and I looked and I looked for about 15 minutes. Finally, I was like, are you sure these are marked? What, where in the world? So he took the card and he showed me where the mark was and he'd marked it with a pocket knife, but it blended in so well that he was right. There's no way you could see it. But once he showed me where that mark was, from that point on, when he put a card up in front of me, my eyes went immediately to the mark. It was like the mark was bigger than the uh, actual card. So that's how the subconscious works. Uh, you've probably noticed it. If you're looking for a certain car, you'll start seeing billboards or hear commercials. If you're looking for a bed, you know, all of a sudden you'll see a bed, uh, mattress, billboard that you've probably seen a million times but uh, never paid attention to. So we only recognize what we're familiar with. So in pool, um, you know, we only have a certain amount of senses that we use playing pool. We don't really use our uh, sense of taste and smell, but uh, maybe some people do. Maybe uh, get a bad taste in your mouth when you get beat or something. <laughs> but uh, but for the most part, you're going to, you know, see the things that you see. You're going to hear the things you can hear and feel the things that you can feel. Uh, 
did I say that right? See what you see, hear what you hear, and feel what you feel. I, I told you about a, a self-hypnosis uh, technique in my last video that's very powerful when you, uh, when you make yourself aware of these uh, senses, but I'm going to talk about them in a, in, a, in a different sense. No pun intended. Or maybe there was. Um, so in the studies that I've done, I've got a master's degree in uh, neuro-linguistic programming, the study of how words are used to program the mind. And it was put together by Richard Bandler, who was a uh, computer programmer, and John Grinder, who was a master linguist. And they got together and uh, joined forces to create like a meta model for the English language. So uh, they would be able to elicit the information from people that did things really, really good so that they could teach it. So this is a very important uh, ability to have. And in neurolinguistic programming, there's, there's branches of a lot of different things. Uh, and they all involve the mind like... Uh, Hypnosis. I've got a degree in Ericksonian hypnosis. Not to be able to hypnotize people. I just always wanted to uh, be able to protect myself from, you know, getting hypnotized somehow. Because I didn't really know what it was when I got involved. Uh, now I do, but it's different than what I first thought. It's nothing far out. It's just a natural process that uh, that. Milton Erickson especially learned how to do at a super high level and he could change people's subconscious uh, behaviors just by talking to them and uh, telling them stories. One guy uh, I remember had a, uh, you know, where he wet the bed and he was an older guy and uh, Milton Erickson uh, set him down and uh, Milton was in a wheelchair but uh, in his office Milton was telling him a story about a uh, tomato plant and how regular you watered the tomato plant. And he went into this long, drawn-out story and and, uh, and ended up successful with the guy. But but the, the man's wife came in, you know, and they're paying a lot of money for this uh, hypnosis. And, and But she doesn't see Milton doing anything uh, unusual. I guess she thought he'd be, uh, you know... Uh, dangling a, a watch uh, in front of his face or, you know, that's all stuff on movies. That's really not how it works. But, um, but uh, when she went in and, and uh, started to say something to Milton about why isn't he hypnotizing her husband, he just put his uh, finger over his mouth and, and pointed at her husband and he's over there just out of it. <laughs> she can, she can tell immediately that he's in a deep hypnotic trance and, uh, it's amazing how all that stuff works, and uh, especially if you're on the other end of it. That's why I do not watch the news or uh, TV at all because, you know, unless it's a movie, even the movies are predictive programming these days for the most part, but um, it's good to be able to recognize these things, so I'm going to make you more familiar with them. Because uh, one of the things that's very beneficial to me is to be able to read eye access patterns. And uh, that that is a, a, uh, a system that you can tell not what people are thinking, but how they're thinking. Because when somebody is, is really thinking about something and telling you the stories, when, when they're talking in a visual sense, like they've seen something, they'll always look up. And if you look one way, it's a visual uh, construct where you're putting those visual uh, images together. The other side is visual remembered, where you're actually remembering the, uh, the images that you're describing. And then you have the auditory. The auditory is in the, in the center. So you'll see somebody that's real auditory and their, their eyes will go back and forth and stay pretty much in the middle. They won't go up because they're not visual. I think a lot of pool players are visual. That's probably my strongest sense, even though I, uh, I've worked hard to develop the others through the years, and there are processes to do that. But we generally uh, process the world through 
one particular sense. And um, I say that because of a couple reasons. Uh, one is if you're, let's say you're auditory and you want to play pool better, and uh, but you're getting all kinds of advice on all visual stuff like aiming and, and uh, you know, everything that you can see. I just want to tell you one example. One of the best bank pool players that I've ever met, I asked him and was eliciting his process for how well he banked. And what he focuses on is the sound of the ball hitting the pocket. When he sees a bank, he sees it, but then he, in his mind, he imagines the sound, and then he tries to create that sound. So that may be something good for uh, those of you out there that are more auditory. If you're more kinesthetic, which is the sense of, uh, the, the feeling sense, uh, you know, you might want to get more into, you know, how the uh, the shot feels, you know, and, and the feel of the, of the cue hitting the cue ball. And uh, So what I'm doing when I approach a shot is I've got a pre-shot routine where I practice everything that I can first before I go down on the shot so that uh, I can get down on the shot as if I've already made it. That's my goal is to get my pre-shot routine and my process down so well that uh, I go down and shoot every shot as if I've already made it. That's the ultimate confidence. And to do that, when I'm above the ball is when I do my aiming and that and my aligning. I've said that I align center to center first and then visually look at creating the angle. And what you'll notice when you do it is you don't have to, uh, to move your head. If you stand center to center, you'll be able to see every shot up till a half ball hit and that starts your cut shot. So once you get to a half a ball angle, you have to go from center to center to center to edge for your starting point. Then you can see all the cut shots from that position without moving your head. So when I'm above the ball, I'm seeing the balls about 50-50. You know, I'm connecting them together and uh, seeing where I want the cue ball to go and, and, and the zone that I want to get into. So all my visual stuff is done above the ball because once I get down and my fingers touch the cloth, I go into a feeling mode, my touch mode, feel and touch, because shot making, I believe, is more about feel than it is about visual. Uh, Mike LeBron was a great shot maker, and I know when he won the U.S. Open, he was wearing glasses to rack the balls, and I know he couldn't see very well, but he could cut the paint off of, of the balls because his alignment was really good. And once your alignment's good, then you can really tap into your feel and touch. Because most of the uh, champion players are always going to say, when they're playing really well, that they have a feel for the pocket. And they, they really uh, have a heightened sense of uh, awareness. And, and, and it's really, you know, that's subconscious type uh, things when you talk about feel and touch. You know, if you're going to aim with... with uh, with feel, you know, you're talking about a natural process, and, and I've heard a lot of uh, champion players say they, they don't use any aiming systems, but, you know, they, they do, but it's just subconscious, so they're just not aware of it. That's where it gets challenging is to teach uh, subconscious uh, behaviors and, and uh, processes consciously. That's why I've had to learn a lot about this kind of stuff to be able to, to teach at this level. So... Again, when I'm above the shot, I've got, you know, the pre-shot routine. I, I can't tell you about that. I have to show you that. I've got some uh, instructional videos at cjwiley.com that, uh, that go into the pre-shot routine. But I'm basically seeing what I see. When I get down, I'm feeling what I feel. And then when I actually hit the ball, I'm watching the object ball. But then I'm feeling the hit on the cue ball. I'm hearing the sound of the object ball hit the pocket, and I always watch where the object ball hits the pocket because that's the destination target, and that's very useful information, especially if I undercut a ball. That's like a red flag for me because that means something's wrong because the way my game is designed, I've taken the undercut out of the game. 
just like Jack Nicholas said in golf, that he took the left side of the golf course out of play by how he uh, moved the ball from left to right. So he never hit the ball left. And when I'm playing really good, I never undercut a shot. I overcut shots once in a while. But I do that with a speed, usually, to give myself the best chance to get safe and uh, not give my opponent a shot. So that is um, um, important to know. They call it the pro side when you overcut it, but that's basically why, because you're going to increase your odds of getting safe. It's really demoralizing to play somebody that, that rarely misses a ball, and then when they do, they, they get lucky, it seems, when they miss, but it's really not luck. It's uh, We're playing the odds of that because uh, – I mean, if we just flat out miss a, a shot, that's different. You know, you're probably going to get a shot, or if you don't, that is luck. But uh, that that's not what I'm referring to. So see what you see, hear, uh, hear what you hear, feel what you feel. So you got to get your, uh, your senses involved, but again, in the right order. Because if I'm trying to use my... Uh, my visual sense and my auditory sense and my kinesthetic sense all at the same time, it's, it's really going to dilute all of them or they're not, they're not going to be as strong as if I just focused on one at a time. Just like a blind person can hear better and feel better, somebody that's deaf will have generally better eyesight and also a better feel and touch. Um, so that's how the mind works. You know, when one of our senses is, uh, depleted, the others will, will raise up. And, uh, so I take advantage of that playing pool and those eye access patterns are very, uh, useful too, especially if I do watch TV and watch somebody interviewed, I can definitely tell if they're lying or not because, uh, it'll totally mismatch what you know, they're saying, because generally they're going to stay auditory. And I've seen a few instances of that lately. Uh, when Captain Cook or Captain Kirk went to space, they, uh, they interviewed him. And uh, that was, that was obviously, uh, uh, he had never seen what he said he was going to, he, he was seeing. <laughs> anyway, I could go on and on about that, but it is useful. So, you know, Maybe Google uh, NLP eye access patterns if you're interested in that because the feeling mode is when somebody uh, looks down to the left and uh, if they look down to the right, it's um, when they're talking to themselves. And it's called auditory digital. So again, it's very useful information. I was big time in the nightclub business and there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of times that I would use that with people that we thought weren't honest, and, and it didn't take me long to uh, to figure out, uh, you know, if they're, what they were saying was matching what they were thinking. So, uh, very useful. So, get into the feel and touch of the, uh, of the game. That's what I'd highly recommend. And again, to do that, you need to be able to connect to the game and the way that I'd recommend that you connect to the game is either center to center or center to edge on every single shot. That gives you the same starting point and allows you to plug in to the game because the game is the teacher. But you've got to know how to uh, elicit the information from the teacher. That reminds me of the guy that first told me that the game is already perfect. You just have to uncover it. And when he told me that, it sparked something in my mind. And that is what I've been on a mission to do for several years. And I'm, I'm very close to uh, completing that mission of uh, really understanding how to bring out the perfection of the game. And a notch above that is to be able to teach others, which uh, I've been a natural teacher all my life. I started out teaching tennis when I was 12. And uh, I was, uh, you know teaching martial arts when I was 23. I went through 1,700 martial arts lessons and uh, golf with Hank Haney. I've told you about, I worked with him for 15 months. He actually put me in his book uh, about Tiger Woods called The Big Miss. I'd highly recommend that if you like sports and, uh, and 
you know, Tiger Woods especially, he uh, really does a good job with that book, telling the inside of working with Tiger Woods. Uh, Tiger didn't like the book very much, needless to say, because he was very honest. <laughs> and he had some uh, funny stories, one about a popsicle that was uh, especially hilarious. So anyway, that's about it for today. I am uh, making a little bit more progress here, hopefully. So uh, I will be in Fort Lauderdale later tonight at a place called Beyond Billiards. Looks like around 8 o'clock if I'm slowed down. So uh, if you like this story, uh, join my uh, instructional website. If you get a chance, it's cjwiley.com. If you want to schedule a uh, private lesson in Florida in February 2022, uh, cjwiley at cjwiley.com. Till next time, this is CJ over and out.